Great to see some bright faces. I know it's a little bit early and uh, I just got a few calls. I think some people are still trickling in, but we'll begin. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Anandya Ghos. He's another brave soul who has braved the sandy storm and uh, to be here with us today. He is flown all the way from New York. Uh, so welcome, Anandya. Uh, Professor Anandya Ghos is an Associate Professor of Information Operations and Management Sciences and Robert L. and Dale Atkins Rosen Faculty Fellow at New York University's Leonard N. Stern School of Business. He's a visiting associate professor at Wharton School and an affiliate faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. He's also a Paduno Fellow. Welcome, Anandya. <laughs> Thanks, Rima. Uh, good morning. Thanks for here this, being here this morning. I know it's Saturday. Uh, so what I plan to talk about this morning is uh, some of my uh, ongoing research in the space of mobile, uh, combined with my ongoing research in the space of big data. Uh, so at NYU, uh, with another colleague, Vasandar, I run a center called the Center for Business Analytics. And uh, we just launched this two months back. And some of the projects that we've been interested in in this space involve trying to understand you know, causal user behavior in the mobile space. Right? So, um, so the story starts about four years back. I, know I first saw this uh, you know, sentence somewhere on the World Wide Web uh, that we live in a world of smartphones and stupid people. Right? And of course, I was in splits when I first saw it, but it sort of triggered an intrinsic curiosity in me to go ahead and study what is it that we actually do with our mobile phones. As users, what do we, uh, how do we use it? And so that started on, uh, you know, for a multi-year, multi-country research program in this space. And, uh, and uh, what, one of the reasons why I thought this is fascinating is because if you take any part of our lives, um, I can't imagine a single part of our life which is not influenced by mobile device in one form or the other, right? Um, how many of us here have a smartphones? Okay. Almost everybody, right? So think about what you do with your smartphones throughout the day, right? Um, you know, mobile phones have evolved a lot over the years. Um, we've come a long way from, uh, you know, those bulky feature phones to the smaller feature phones to more sleek uh, mobile phones now. And in fact, case in point is, this is the fastest adopted technology ever uh, in terms of penetration and user adoption. We have adopted mobile devices faster than almost any other technology that exists out there in the world. Um, and you know, going back, as I said, when you wake up in the morning, what do you first do? You know, many of us, you check your email, you open up the weather app, you check your weather, you log on to a social networking site, and you post an update or you comment on somebody else's post. Uh, if you're a fitness freak, then the app that uh, might actually tell you what you should be exercising on a certain day, what you should be eating. Uh, when you're traveling, you might be taking photos, uh, pictures, and uploading them on social networking sites, right? And, so, and the list just goes on and on. When you're driving, you might be using apps, uh, the maps to actually figure out where to drive. So, you know, my point is that over the years I've realized that I think the right word is we're addicted to our mobile phones, right? If there's one thing that we don't forget to take away when we leave home, that's our mobile phone, right? So, uh, I might even argue that we're obsessed because no matter where we are, right, we need our mobile devices, right? How many of us sleep with our mobile devices on our bed? I do, right? And, you know, when you first walk into a restaurant with a group of friends, what do you first do? You check in, right? Check into Foursquare or check into Facebook, right? Uh, so no matter what you're doing, and we're not this too far away from a world where <coughs> we might even be doing this, right? If someone's in trouble, right, the first thing you'll do is take a picture, upload it on Facebook, you know, get lots of likes and comments, increase our cloud score, and then figure out what to do with the person. And this isn't happening only during leisure time, right? So, uh, you know, there's an angry bird effect that's out there now, which basically says that, at least in the US economy, the angry birds game, the popular angry birds game, has cost us $1.5 billion in productivity loss right, over the years. So, uh, when the next time when your boss asks you, well, are you giving 100% at work, right? Uh, and you say, yeah, I am giving 100%, what you probably really mean is, you are giving 100% over the entire week. Right? Not on a single day. So, bottom line is, you know, we've come a long way with the use of mobile devices. And the good thing is that, at least for 
a data nerd like me is that this is creating lots and lots of data, right? So this is what I do. I, I dabble with big data sets, uh, trying to figure out you know, what consumers do with mobile devices, and most importantly, why we should care. Why, you know, why, what would marketers and firms and brands and advertisers learn from all of this? Right? So here's some examples of things I've been looking at. Um, you know, uh, so we all know about apps now. As I said, you know, almost every part of our life is now influenced in some way or the other by apps. Uh, apps have various ways to monetize themselves. One common way is in-app advertising, and a second increasing way is in-app purchases, right? Uh, then you've got mobile content, which is essentially uh, you know, a result of how we browse in the mobile web. So when I'm traveling from place A to place B, I have mobile with me because by definition it's portable, and I can access it and browse the mobile internet at any point in time and, and, and you know, sort of go on from there. In the course of accessing the mobile internet, I might get exposed to mobile ads. And the ads come in a variety of form. They could be display ads, rich media ads, uh, video ads, and so on. Um, and mobile commerce is finally here, right? So we've been hearing about mobile commerce for a while, but yeah, it's finally taken off. Uh, yeah, many people are not buying cars or mobile phones, but they are buying lots of other products, you know, books, movies, uh, food, apparel, shoes, and whatnot. And finally, I think the, you know, over the last year or so, what I've seen more recently is that the mobile device has become uh, you know, part of a larger kit of devices. We use our mobile phones, smartphones, in conjunction with tablets and laptops and PCs, and even the television, right? So when I measure these things, I have to be very careful to make sure that I don't measure these effects in silos. Because if I measure them as silos, then I'm going to be missing a big part of the uh, the puzzle here, which is what I shouldn't be doing. And so these are the kind of uh, things I'll talk about uh, this morning. So a consequence of all this usage is that we have big data now, right? Uh, big data exploding, uh, and we have very rich data. So it's not just big in size, we have access to extremely granular user level data. We have second to second user interaction with mobile devices, right? I know also which location the user was accessing his or her mobile device, what they were doing, what they were browsing. Uh, I also know the user's interaction from person to person to person, if he or she is sending an SMS message or making a voice call or sending multimedia messages, right? And, and so on. So this is essentially over the last you know, four years, I've been doing this multi-country, multi-year study involving a consortium of companies from uh, China, South Korea, Germany, the US. I haven't had a chance to work with data in India, so here's a shameless plug. If you have data and you want me to take a look at it, just let me know. Okay? And most of my toolkits involve different methods. So it's either causal modeling or randomized experiments or predictive analytics. And, and this is some, some of the things I'll share with you this morning. All right, so first I want to talk about a few caveats. Uh, since, as I said, I care about measurement, right? So yeah, there's a lot of data, there's big data, and with big data comes great power. But as you also know from the movie Spider-Man, right, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Which really means that I have to be really, really careful about what I measure. Especially since I'm interested in causality here, I'm not interested so much in correlations. I have to be very, very careful about understanding how the data is generated across all these devices and across all these platforms, right? So Albert Einstein said famously many years back that, you know, uh, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted really counts. And, you know, I can't imagine this to be more true than in the domain of mobile. Because uh, what I'll show you next is, you know, at least uh, three different reasons why one has to be careful about mobile measurements. What is what is fundamentally still problematic with mobile analytics is the way the data is generated in these devices. Okay? So yeah, I mean, mobile is the most uh, you know, measurable channel, but it has unique measurable uh, challenges as well. Right? So first of all, you know, when I look at the data, I have to make sure I understand that this, the smartphone, obviously is not the laptop, right? it's not the PC or the Mac, but it's not a tablet either. Right? And when I look at data, I have to first figure out if the data is coming from a tablet or from a smartphone, if not from a, uh, a PC. So there are three main challenges that exist with mobile analytics today, and, and they all have to do with how the data is generated. Okay? The first big challenge is that usage is very diverse. Okay? Uh, 
Uh, and I, I'll talk about what that I mean by that, but it really reflects the fact that we have so many different devices, so many different platforms, so many different uh, operating systems. The second is the ecosystem is very fragmented, right? And the third is that persistent identity, identifying a user from media to media, from device to device, right, across time is still a challenge right? because cookies do not work in mobile phones. Right? So we have to figure other ways to get around this, right? So when I say usage is diverse, so think about this, right? Modality, we can access mobile phones either to, you know, to use as an SMS device or to uh, use apps or to use the mobile web. We could use a smartphone or a feature phone or a tablet. We could use a variety of different browser types. We could use a variety of different OS, Android, and uh, iOS, and I'll be kind, you know, Windows and um, Blackberry as well. But bottom line is, whenever I see data that's coming from mobile devices, I have to figure out all of these first, if not more than that. So this results in data silos, right? So when I'm looking at data in mobile from all of these companies, I see that data is actually generated in silos, and so I have to first figure out how to integrate them. Okay? And, and that's a non-trivial uh, non piece of work, because carriers often strip out a lot of this information, right? So, uh, you know, in web analytics, we can use IP addresses to actually uniquely identify visitors or cookies to identify visitors. That doesn't work with mobile because the IP addresses that you see are actually the IP addresses of the network access providers. It's not the mobile user's IP address, right? The mobile ecosystem is fragmented. Like, think about all the players who are involved in the data being generated, right? So first you've got the carriers, and these are some examples from the U.S. But in, in India, I think about Vodafone or uh, Airtel, right? You've got publishers. You've got the CNNs and the Times of India and you know, ESPNs. You've got a variety of OEMs, Samsung, uh, you know, Apple, uh, Motorola. You've got different operating systems. You've got a different bunch of ad networks who control all the ad exchanges and the ad, and the ad inventory. Uh, and you've got retailers too. And the fact that a lot of these retailers like iTunes and Google Android are trying to integrate mobile payments through their own uh, system makes it even more non-trivial to figure out uh, you know, what the source of the data is. Right? So again, the second thing I have to figure out when I take a look at data set mobile is which of these players was involved in the generation of that data set. Right? Because fundamentally I'm trying to figure out how a certain intervention causes a change in user behavior and unless I figure out what the source of the data is, uh, you know, the analysis is not going to be complete and meaningful. And the third thing, uh, and, and a, a consequence of this fragmentation is that data can get munged along the way. Okay. The third thing is that, you know, unlike web analytics, persistent identity is still a big challenge with mobile. Right? Uh, you know, Java, which is very useful for web analytics, Java is not universally effective in mobile devices. Uh, you know, pixel tagging, for example, works, but sometimes it's not ineffective. Um, Third-party cookies, by the way, are by default, they are turned off in iOS devices, right? So, you, the, you know, you have to actually uh, incentivize the user to encourage uh, have third-party cookies. And even if you have cookies, right, they are session dependent, which means as soon as the session is turned off, the cookie is eradicated, right? So, there's only so much information you can get from that. And of course, apps, you don't have cookies for apps. So essentially, what we are relying in our analysis is other forms of identification, like the MSIDN number, or the hands, unique handset number, and so on. But it's important to figure out that, I know, I have to circumvent all of these obstacles to identify the same user's behavior on multiple devices and multiple channels. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, now that you know what the issues are, I'll sort of go ahead and talk about uh, you know, some of the, you know, projects that we've been doing and how we address all these interesting questions here. So, uh, to keep in mind with mobile analytics, how it's different, is that it's really a two-step process. You know, over the years, I've worked with a lot of data from the web, this is the regular PC internet, right? So, data generation process is much more straightforward there. So, I don't really have to worry about step one, right, which is, what are the measurement challenges intrinsic in the data generation process, right? I can go fundamentally to step two, which is if I'm interested in causal user behavior, I'm essentially trying to figure out uh, changes in user behavior before and after a certain intervention, which means I have to look at various statistical or econometric challenges. I don't have to worry about these things. But in mobile, I really have to first figure this out before I get into step two, okay? 
So whether I'm interested in audience measurement or ad effectiveness measurement, um, unless I'm able to tackle those three issues with mobile analytics, you know, any measurements is going to be erroneous. So um, I've started with the first project. Uh, about four years back, we started working with uh, companies in South Korea. And South Korea, as many of you know, like Japan, is one of the leading pioneers in the mobile space. So these guys had smartphones and sort of variable pricing of smart on data on smartphones much before we had uh, even the US had, right? So uh, one of the questions you're interested in is when people are traveling, okay, uh, in part of their daily lives, how are they using mobile devices? What kinds of content are they uploading? What are they downloading? And this could involve, you know, ringtones and wallpapers and screensavers, or it could involve some more, you know, heavier, uh, he heavier files like videos or pictures, right? So people take pictures and videos and upload them and download them. So, for example, suppose uh, <coughs> this is a, a, day, a project from the city of Seoul. Uh, this is one of the key hubs in Seoul. And essentially, imagine a user A who goes from point A to point B, okay? goes to point C, and then back to A, right? So this could be, A could be his home, B could be his work, C could be a client visit, and then back home, right? So this is a typical user uh, travel pattern in the city of Seoul. Now, on another day, uh, the same user might be going to point B, then goes to C, but instead of going back to A, the user goes to point D, and then E, and then goes back to A, right? And this could be, again, this could be a, di a digression in a standard travel pattern. It could be additional client visits, or it could be some other recreational visit, right? So what we are interested in looking at is, since we could track the, and this is hundreds of thousands of users, we could track every user across every location and what they were doing on the mobile devices. We wanted to predict, uh, you know, if we could, based on the travel patterns, if we could figure out how a user would consume the mobile device on a certain day at a certain location at a certain point in time, right? And the idea was if you could nail that down with a fairly good high degree of accuracy, then, you know, the ROI from targeted ads are gonna be much higher because you can reach the right person at the right time and the right place, right? The first thing we realized was uh, when it comes to mobile browsing, to simply using the internet to, you know, feed off content, people often use the mobile device as an appetizer. Your PC is your entree. So essentially, you like some, you read something, you find it interesting, you're probably not gonna consume all of it on the mobile device, because screen, smaller screen size makes it harder to read. So you favorite it, you bookmark it, you know, if it's a tweet, you favorite it, you go back and read it on your PC. Okay? But when it comes to mobile commerce, it doesn't always start that way, right? So with, with, with simply browsing, you know, feeding of content or reading the news, you would do it this way, but when it comes to commerce, people actually don't always start with the mobile phone and end with a PC. Those sequences matter. Um, so, uh, the second thing we found out was that, you know, in, in all those travel patterns, the variance in users' travel patterns is a much stronger predictor of your propensity to buy a product or consume a service on your mobile device rather than the mean, which really means uh, in sort of simpler terms that the greater the number of unique places you travel on a certain day, higher the likelihood you're actually going to consume or buy a product of a mobile device. Um, and, you know, again, why would marketers care about this is because, look, you know, we are able to pin down your contextual data, both location and time on a certain, on a, on a device specific uh, database. And, you know, if a cosmetic company wants to promote its brands in Times Square in the middle of Midtown Manhattan, right, what should it do? It should obviously target people who are there at that point in time, but it should also look to target people who are likely to be there at that point in time. Right? And this is what we could do with this project. We could predict which users are more likely to be in Times Square or in any part of the city on a certain day at a certain time, and then give that information to brands, advertisers to have targeted ads. Right? And so advertisers would, would want to see the right person see their ad at the right time, uh, at the right device, the right location. All right, so the third thing was, and I was curious about, well, how soon do mobile shoppers actually buy a product, right? So, yeah, mobile commerce is taking off. We can predict if they're going to buy it, but how soon will they buy it? If they see an ad today, will they buy it today? Or are they going to buy it a week from now or a month from now, right? And we did this for a variety of different product categories. So, uh, you know, again, from uh, high frequency bought products like movies and music to and restaurants for shoes and apparel, cosmetics products. So it turns out that uh, the same effect, mobile shoppers, those who want to buy something, they are actually pretty quick 
on the trigger. So mobile shoppers, 94% of people will actually end up buying on the same day, uh, and only 6% actually buy later. And again, we know how, you know, how much later, uh, and we can classify that if it's within a week or a fortnight, but usually later means a week or so. Uh, what about location, right? So I just told you that you know I could predict users' location and send targeted ads. Uh, does location matter? And again, it does. It does matter because of the people who buy the product in the same location, a very high number, 95% buy on the same day, and only 5% buy later, right? And of the people who buy the same product in a different location, and when I say location, I mean where you were exposed to the ad and when you bought the product. So given the data, I know when you saw the ad, which location and I know when you actually bought it, so I can actually match if there's a discrepancy between where you see the ad and where you buy the product. So of the people who buy in a different location, uh, only 41% actually buy on the same day, right? So again, why would marketers and brands be interested in this? Because we can say that, look, if you're trying to target a person, a user A in a certain location, send him multiple ads on the same day. He's, there's a 95% chance he's gonna convert on the same, the same location as opposed to somebody who's buying in a different location. And because we could identify these users, amongst the hundreds of thousands of users, uh, it's a pretty big sample for advertisers and brands to uh, play around with. Right? Um, all right, so after this project, you know, uh, one thing that occurred to me was, look, um, yeah, you know, we can send targeted mobile coupons, right? People want to redeem coupons, we can send them coupons in the mobile phones. But coupons have a number of different factors that will influence your propensity to buy. For example, uh, it depends on the distance from where you see, uh, where you get the coupon to where the nearest retail location is, right? So if I get a coupon for Starbucks at least five miles away from the nearest Starbucks, that's probably not meaningful. If I get a coupon for Starbucks and a half a kilometer away from where I am, that's probably more meaningful, right? But it also depends on the face value of the coupon. If it's a full coupon for a free Frappuccino, right? Which is, you know, $5, five in the US versus a 50% you know, discount of the smallest pot of coffee, which is you know, a dollar, the face value of the coupon would also matter in influencing whether I actually go and redeem that. So then we, uh, we partnered with a company in Germany on this, and we did a bunch of randomized experiments. Uh, this was massive, really massive, massive project involving thousands of users across Germany. And what we did is we said, look, let's create uh, you know, a number of different control groups, right? So, I can get access to the coupon on my mobile device, and the coupon can have a certain face value, $5, $10, $20 off. And those listings that you see over there on the mobile device or on a PC, they can be ordered by distance to where I see it, right? So it can be ordered in sort of an ascending order of distance from me and the nearest store location. And so we ended up creating multiple treatment groups, uh, control group and treatment group. Uh, group one had location information just sorted by distance. Group two did not have location information, but it was sorted by distance. Group three did not have location information and it was randomized sorted simply by price, for example. And group four had location information and randomized sorted by price, right? And so the question was, if I want to lure a customer to my retail outlet, what is the discount I should offer as a function of distance of that customer from that retail outlet, right? And what we find is that basically a 10%, you need a 10% discount in order to lure a customer for every one kilometer distance between the customer and the retail brand outlet, right? So on average, a 1% discount for every 100 meter distance between where the customer is and where the retail outlet is. Right? And we could do this, we did this for you know, dozens of product categories, so, uh, but this is the average. If you're interested in specifics, I can tell you what's it for apparel, you know, coffee, food, movies, uh, books, and so on. So, so this research helped us disentangle this trade-off between the face value of a coupon and the distance between the, and the user and uh, the nearest retail outlet. Right? And because these are randomized experiments out in the wild, uh, you know, I can ascertain with a lot of uh, you know, precision, this is an like actual cause and effect rather than some correlation between a marketing intervention and, and user behavior. Right, so the next project was actually about understanding mobile users' path to purchase, right? So, so far I've been talking about pretty much one device, right? So people are buying on mobile phones, they're seeing ads, you're targeting them, you're predicting where they travel, and then we incentivize them to buy a product, right? 
Uh, but as we are, most of us know, right, mobile devices are not working in silos. They are working in tandem with other similar devices like tablets and laptops and PCs. Right? So what I really wanted to figure out was that as your task importance increases, right, from one extreme where essentially you're just getting access to free content, how would you be using these three devices? So that's a smartphone, that's a tablet, and that's a laptop. And essentially, as the task importance increases from free content to actually paying for content for yourself, and then all the way paying for content for somebody else, right? So essentially, you know, as you go from left to right, the importance of the task increases. When you're buying a gift for somebody, they're probably going to spend more effort in figuring out what the right gift should be, right? And controlling for the product type. So this is controlling for the same product. What we see is that you know, when it's free content, about 87% of the people are using laptops and tablets. When it's buying for yourself, you know, it's still about 85% people are There's a small decrease in smartphone usage and increase in laptop usage. But when it's buying gifts for other people, uh, and this is a proxy for increasing task complexity, it turns out that we uh, users, we revert back to our laptops, right? So the small screen size still seems to matter when you're buying things for, 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 other, for other people. Right? And, and we see a similar pattern when it comes to popular content versus you know, sort of niche content. So if I'm buying a blockbuster movie or a book, I'm definitely going to be using my smartphone, right? But if I'm buying a very niche product and that most people haven't heard of, that's in the long tail of sales, I'm much more likely to use a PC or a laptop compared to a smartphone. Um, so this, this project then sort of you know, led us to think about you know, the effectiveness of advertising, right? So, uh, what we have learned so far is that you know we can predict users' location and time. We can send them ads, and we can uh, you know look at these synergy between devices. But how effective are mobile ads really? Right? And I think you know from my experience, this was the largest project in terms of size and scope that we did. This is, uh, involves more than 32 billion impressions of mobile and web ads uh, across uh, multiple regions and multiple uh, time periods. But here's what it is, right? So. Essentially, when I'm walking in the offline world, I'm getting exposed to lots of banner ads on the streets, right? Common here. When I'm surfing on the internet and I'm Googling, I get exposed to lots of search keyword ads. And when I'm playing out with my mobile device, I get access to ads either in the form of display or search okay, on publisher sites, or I get exposed to ads within an app, correct? So what we were interested in looking at here is when the same user is exposed to the same ad on multiple media, does that increase their propensity to buy that product? Or does it not affect it at all? Or does it actually cannibalize it, right? Potentially, you could argue that people get annoyed by too much targeting of ads, so maybe it's not going to work, right? So we want to just look at mobile versus web. And uh, again, from summer of this year, you might recall this video, the famous viral video of Gangnam Style, right? So we all watch Gangnam Style on YouTube, right? But you know who made money of Gangnam Style, right? It's Google, right? So Google made seven million dollars purely in three months of display ads on YouTube. This became historically the most liked video on YouTube, right? Ever. And just in three months, Google made uh, three million dollars, which is what prompted Eric Schmidt to have a dance session with this particular singer. Uh, and why wouldn't he, right? Uh, so what he said is, okay. Let's see that if the user gets exposed to ads on a mobile device, either a smartphone or a tablet, and the same ad for the same user on a PC or a laptop, does that cross-media exposure increase or decrease the propensity to uh, you know, react to the ad, either in the form of clicks and you know, more importantly and more meaningfully conversions, right? So we actually track user conversions um, across all these devices. And, and then the key was, look, you know, if, if I'm a mobile ad uh, advertising manager who's trying to figure out how much money to put in mobile advertising, I have to you know, make sure that I realize that there are these synergies, possible synergies, between mobile and web, right? So if I look at mobile ads only in, as a, uh, in silo, again, that's not correct. I have to make sure that I understand that mobile ad budget can increase mobile clicks and web clicks, which in turn can increase web conversions and mobile conversions, right? So no big surprises here, but since I care about measurement, what I really want to know is how much, okay? So if I see the same ad twice on two different media, on two different devices, 
by how much does that increase my propensity to buy that product, right? We are no longer in the world of you know, simply executing strategies, we care about measurements here. So this is, as I said, this is a big project that combined a massive archival data analysis with uh, randomized field experiments also in the wild. We worked with, uh, this was non-trivial because we had to work with advertisers, with the mobile operators, with the platform device people. Uh, eventually we got, we got around to it. And uh, so what we see is that with click-through rates, if the ad is only shown on web versus both the web and the mobile channel, right? So you get a higher click-through rate on the web channel by 34%, and you get also a higher click-through rate on the mobile channel, right? Which is okay, but you know, we all, increasingly we see that click-throughs on display ads are really not that meaningful, so I really care more about the actual conversion, the actual action. So there what we see is that, yeah, on the web channel, when people get exposed to the ad only on the uh, internet versus the PC and the mobile internet, there's a higher conversion rate for web by 36%. On the mobile channel, however, the conversion rate for both web and mobile goes down, right? And it doesn't mean that the ad is not working. What it really means is that people are seeing the ad on web and mobile, but going back to buying it on the web. And, and this, uh, this effect would vary by different products. For some products, it was 16%. For some, it was slightly less. For some, slightly more. But essentially, we saw a lot of cases where people saw the ad in both the channels, but they went ahead and bought it off their PCs or off their laptops. So essentially, you know, what I'm trying to say is that there are these non-trivial cross-device synergies we should care about. For example, uh, you know, 17%, what you see here is 17% of people who see an ad actually end up buying it either on a tablet or a smartphone, okay? So again, going back to the fact that, you know, mobile is an appetizer and PC is an entree, look, here's the other way around. Because uh, here I'm talking about mobile commerce, which is different from mobile browsing. And again, I have to be really, really careful about figuring out how the data is being generated and which device people are following and, and so on. So people ask, well, you know, why would people buy it off a different device. And so somebody said, well, you know, you don't want to be sharing everything that you're buying with people back home, right? Mobile is a very personal device, and this lets you do that. So um, I hope I've been able to convince you somewhat that marketers need a multi screen strategy, right? Um, but what, you know, what do we do with that, right? So this was a study, this is not, uh, a, this visual is from a study done by Google. What you see is that you know, people on an average spend time across four different devices, right? Uh, starting with a smartphone to a tablet to a PC and TV. So it's not just the second screen effect anymore. We have four screens now going on, right? Uh, some of three, some of four, but we have multiple screens here. What I was interested in is looking at, you know, device usage across all of these platforms in terms of the sequence. A lot of uh, you know, people I talk to often make the mistake of saying, okay, yeah, we need a multi-screen strategy. What they don't often mention is that there is a difference between using two devices sequentially versus simultaneously. So I'm watching a TV and I'm using my iPad as well. That's simultaneous usage. Whereas if I start a shopping session on a smartphone and then wrap it up on a tablet or a PC, that's sequential usage, right? So I really have to be careful about, when I see this data, I have to be careful about if it's sequentially used or simultaneous usage, again, to make any meaningful inferences out of it. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of work with app developers, and, uh, you know, as of now, at least 25 billion apps, uh, apps have been downloaded at least 25 billion times, uh, maybe even more uh, as of last month. But uh, essentially with apps, there is so much interesting stuff going on that you know, it boggles my mind to try to figure out what I should be studying here, right? So one of the first things to think about is with apps, apps can be offered for free or they can be offered for a certain price, right? So for an app developer, the first thing the developer thinks about is should I offer a free app or should I offer a paid app, right? So, or should I go from a free to a freemium strategy, right? The developers can make money either by pricing the app for a certain price, or they can make money off other sources like advertising or in-app purchases, right? So that's the second thing they have to care about. Like, should they enable in-app purchases? Should they enable in-app advertising? And what other factors are, you know, sort of influential in driving user adoption? And most importantly, retention of these apps, right? 
One other thing we often forget when we look at data on apps is you look at downloads, but you know, downloads are not enough because we know that retention and usage rate on apps vary tremendously. On an average, people use only four apps on the devices, even though they might have 50 apps on it, because that's how we are. You know, we download a lot of apps, but on a regular basis, we only use four or five apps, right? So really, as an advertiser, they care about those four or five apps that a certain user uses more frequently. And if you can reach the right person with the right app in order to monetize it, then you get your bang for the buck, right? So what we've been looking at is, is a trade off, you know, the optimal pricing of apps. We've been looking at trade off between offering an app for free versus enabling in app purchases and in app advertising. Uh, and sort of, you know, essentially the ROI of advertising here, right? So this is a screenshot from Flurry, uh, which is one of the largest mobile analytics companies in the world. And interestingly, you see that in 2011, this is the basically revenue distribution by source, right? So 82% of the revenues for app developers came from premium and in-app purchases. Only 18% came from advertising revenue. In 2012, from $5.4 billion in revenues, it increased to $8.5 billion in revenues, and both the segments grew, okay, in terms of absolute values, not proportionally, but absolute values. So, you know, it tells you a lot about how we are behaving in respect to mobile apps and the potential for monetizing it through, uh, you know, so one of the things we look at is, okay, so should I enable in-app purchases if I do? And what are the kind of ads I should enable within my app? Um, and we do this for different, there are like at least a dozen well-established app categories on both Android and, 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 and Apple. And we have done this for every single app category to uh, share some insights with developers and advertisers about what are the right kind of apps to target your ads in. Uh, apps are not standalone again, right? So this is a distribution of how people behave with respect to television, the internet, and apps. Okay? Notice here the common pattern. Between 7 in the evening and 11 at night, everybody is on these three devices, right? So you're, using, you're browsing on the internet, you're using your app, and you're also watching TV, right? So if for advertisers, if we could target the users between 7 and 11, right, that gives you a much higher probability of monetizing your ad uh, in a more effective way, right? The last thing we looked at was, well, are apps actually cannibalizing the web, right? This is a question I get all the time from app developers and advertisers especially, that should we only have ads on the mobile web and not on the mobile app because maybe the apps are cannibalizing the web. Um, uh, both in my data and in this chart from, you know, from Flurry, you see, I don't see any evidence of that, right? Look at this, right? So in 2010, right, this was the usage pattern of the web and mobile apps. In 2010, it increased, we have a web browsing. In 2011, it was 74 minutes, 70 minutes, 72 minutes. <clears throat> I just think that both categories, at least the app categories, is exponentially increasing, and it's not cannibalizing the mobile web. People are using mobile devices more. And they are allocating more time to both mobile apps and uh, to a less extent to mobile web, right? So my, my sort of <coughs> takeaway recommendation to all these companies has been that, you know, think about establishing a mobile web presence first okay, and then go to the apps, right? So you should not be thinking about is it webs or apps, it should, it's actually web and apps, okay? All right, so last thing, people ask me, what, what have you learned about users so far? <coughs> And, uh, and I thought I'd share this with you. What's the difference in men and women when it comes to mobile devices? Well, we men, we are like uh, Bluetooth, and women are like Wi-Fi. Why? Yeah, makes sense? All right. So at the core, though, we are still all very similar, right? As soon as we get our first break, we break our legs, tap on our mobile phone, and start generating. Okay, so to summarize then, you know, I think what I, what I would like to take away from this is mobile analytics is way more complex than web analytics, okay? We have to be really careful about measurement issues here because the data generation process is very unique. And uh, the good thing is, we're, you know, people who care about this are cognizant about these issues. And we now, once you know the uniqueness and measurement challenges in mobile, we can go and start looking at statistical and econometric challenges in mobile. Yes, you know, we're still crawling. When it comes to mobile analytics, we're still crawling. We're gonna be learning to walk pretty soon because of the fact that increasingly people who care about measurements are aware of these things, right? So yeah, in the short term, some market level goals will carry on, but uh, 
you know, over time we also get around this. So in terms of research, you know, to summarize, I talked about eight different things from our multi-year, multi-country study. Uh, you know, the fact that we've been <clears throat> able to predict mobile internet usage using travel patterns of users uh, so that we could target the right user at the right time, the right place. Uh, when it comes to mobile browsing, mobile is still the appetizer, PC is your entree, right? So we are using our mobile phones to start a certain uh, you know, session, but we're actually finishing it off in terms of content feeding on PCs. Uh, when it comes to mobile advertising, you, know, you have to care about both time and location. Now, either one of them is missing from your data is not going to be meaningful, so because what you've seen is there's a huge proportion of mobile users who end up buying the product they're exposed to at the same time and same location. Okay? I talked about the trade-off between uh, coupon face value and uh, you know, distance from the store. So for every one kilometer distance between you and the retail store, you need to offer a 10% discount to increase the propensity of people to buy. I also talked about how task complexity influences cross-device usage from free content to paid content to content that you're buying for somebody else. Uh, we see that mobile advertising does influence both web and mobile conversions, except that it increases web conversions and slightly reduces mobile conversion because people are still going back and buying it off their laptops. Um, given this, it's very important to triangulate. When you're doing this analysis, it's very important for me to actually triangulate across all of these devices. And more importantly, I need to differentiate between sequential and simultaneous usage of these devices. Okay? And lastly, when it comes to app developers and apps and advertising on apps, you have to think about mobile apps and the mobile web, not apps versus the web. So, so that's it for today. Uh, I encourage you all to generate more data so a nerd like me can get some more data and do something more interesting. Thank you for here being this morning. I know it's Saturday. And I look forward to talking to some of you over the break. Uh, if you want to ping me with anything, that's my email address. And I'd love to hear if you have anything to say. This is regarding measurement on mobile. So uh, we, we don't have a unique IP address for mobile or cookies. So how uh, can we measure that a consumer has gone to a particular website on mobile and on the next day he is again back on the same site. So is there a way to ascertain that yeah. or uh, the question continues. He sees a site on the mobile and then he goes to a tablet, a different device and accesses the same site. So can we establish this linkage that the same consumer is checking the website on a different device or at a different time on mobile? You can do that. Uh, you have to be really careful about doing this. Uh, so the, the most, the easiest way to track a user is through the MSIDN number or the handset, unique handset number, right? Now, you know, as I said, you know, third party cookies are disabled by default. If you, what we do in our experiment, for example, is we actually incentivize users to enable the third party cookies. And first party cookies are there. So what, essentially what you have to do is, you know, what we've learned at least is, we learn by trial and error. So we enable first party and third party cookies. Sometimes they're effective, sometimes we can track the user, sometimes they're not. Uh, if the user logs into the same website using multiple devices, then sure, that makes things a lot easier because I can use the login ID of the user. But if the user hasn't logged in, if they're browsing anonymously, then it's a tad bit harder. Then we have to resort to secondary tactics like uh, you know, enabling first party and third party cookies uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, and a second question, pretty quick. Uh, in terms of you have a study that a person sees mobile ads and web ads and what are the conversion rates? A consumer has, say, two ways of part to purchase. One is the traditional way, only traditional advertisement seen goes and purchase from a brick and mortar shop. Right. Other is uh, mobile consumed, web consumed and goes back to brick and mortar and purchases the stuff. Any insights on what are the conversion rates when it's all traditional versus when he sees mobile and web advertising and goes to a brick and mortar shop? So the second one, you know, it's non-trivial because uh, the first one, like if I'm tracking web and mobile conversions only, right, that's a lot easier because it's all digital, it's enabled, I can measure it. E enabling, uh, tracking the user conversion offline is harder. In the experiment we did with coupons, we could actually track it because the person had to, you know, go back to the retail outlet with the coupon, scan it, so we could track that. So it depends on how you set up the study. If you're setting up through coupons that are digitally enabled, then you can track offline conversions as well. 
And we see, to your question, we see a huge spike in offline transactions for those sort of products. If it's coupon enabled, if it's not something you buy directly off the web or the mobile device, if it's like redeeming a coupon for coffee or for a movie ticket or for a restaurant, is almost 100% conversion happening on the offline channel. Uh, but again, that's only with the caveat that uh, the study has to be designed in a way you can track the user from the online to the offline channel. Uh, for those cases where we showed people ads on web and mobile, there are some who didn't buy off either web and mobile, but they actually went and bought it on the offline store. That's much harder for us to track. Uh, we are doing a few things, for example, you know, we have the same study, we're extending it to incentivize users to, when they go back to the store, the store receptionist or the salesperson ask, how did you hear about us? So it's sort of a survey-based uh, mechanism, but it's not as accurate as I would like it to be. No, but you got to play with what you have, so. Thank you. Uh, so you talked about uh, some sort of study to uh, be able to uh, track between web and mobile. Right. As you scale, um, few years down, few months down, whatever. So how do you sort of see this playing out? You know, I'm the same user, multi-screen, yeah. uh, same profile. Most likely you're going to be consuming almost all of it through your smartphone or your tablet. Your usage of PCs and laptops, this is a trend we see across the four countries I've studied, that the trend is people are consuming less content off the larger screen devices, okay? and it's partly because of convenience, right? But also remember that that's not universally true. Like, uh, you know, if the, if the complexity of the task involves you having to buy a product for, as a gift, right, we still see people using laptops and PCs. But if it's for yourself or just it's a free content, you're going to be using more and more of the smartphones and tablets. But even with smartphones and tablets, they're two different devices, and then you have connected yes. TV sort of come into the picture. Right. So how do you sort of see all of this uh, coming into one user profile? That's, you know, between smartphones and tablets, I don't know, and I would only guess at this point because I think it's right now the proportion is pretty equal. It depends on country to country. You know, the Apple has bought out this iPad mini now, and I don't know if, if it's a smartphone or a tablet, right? It's smack in the middle. Um, I cannot say anything definitively between the smartphone and tablet, which is going to be used more often. Um, I can say in some countries, so you know, I have a project going on in East Africa right now where you know, people can't afford to buy tablets, but almost every person, including people in villages, have some kind of a phone. It doesn't, it's not always a smartphone, it's a feature phone in most cases, but you know, some of the Chinese brands have brought out really ex inexpensive, uh, you know, low-cost smartphones for 50 bucks, and I see farmers and villages in East Africa now buying smartphones. So in that part of the world, Tablet is probably not going to be adopted anytime soon, just because people can't afford it. Um, 